Welcome to Chapter 6, Physical Development, the Body, and the Brain. So in this chapter, we will look at these learning questions. How are the brains of children and adolescents similar to and different from the brains of adults? What disorders are linked with the structure and function of the brain? How do the senses develop during infancy? How do children's bodies change from infancy through adolescence? What factors influence and shape motor development? And what role does nutrition play in development? There will be a total of five videos in this chapter. Um, um, the second learning question here, I'm split, splitting into two parts where we will look at development of the senses in one video and, and motor development in another. Um, sorry, body growth and changes, excuse me, in, in another. So let's begin with brain development. And we will start with a picture of the hemispheres of the brain. You have a left and right hemisphere. You can see that the brain is divided down the middle from front to back into two hemispheres. There is one structure that, that connects the two hemispheres, the corpus callosum. And um, you can kind of see it there in the middle. It's um, it branches across the two hemispheres. And so our two hemispheres um, have different purposes and, and you know, kind of specialize in different things. Uh, first of all, the left hemisphere controls and receives input from, from the right side of the body. So if you move your right arm, it's coming from your left hemisphere. Similarly, if you uh, somebody touches your left arm, it's registered in your right hemisphere. So all the movement and the sensation input, um, it all crosses over the left hemisphere control on the right side, the right hemisphere control on the left side. Also, you'll find that for most people, the left side of the brain is the side of the brain where they have their language center. It's also the side that's known more for logic. It's easy to remember. They all start with L, left hemisphere, goes with, goes with language and logic. Whereas the right hemisphere, um, in some sense, it is um, more artistic in a way. It, it, it's involved in more holistic uh, processing. Um, let me go, let me go back to the left side a little bit. Part of the, um, part of the um, function of the left side or, or the way it operates is more sequentially. It does like step-by-step -step, um, uh, sequences. So this is why it's good for logic. Logic is kind of a sequential step-by-step um, -step process. Okay, if this, then that, you know, um, this is why you like you use your left side for things like um, mathematics, because that's kind of like a step-by-step -step process. The right side, we say, is holistic processing, meaning that it's it's about creating a whole from many parts. You know, like so, if you think about painting, you create a whole picture from little paint dabs and brushes and different colors, and and you, if you um, I don't know, create a um, some kind of structure, you know, it's, it's about building a whole from parts. So an architect, you know, is going to use the right side of the brain to design a building, um, and, and, you know, to try to get it to look a certain way when it's finished. Um, you also um, uh, would, would use your use your right side of the brain for things like music. If you think of that, that's holistic as well. It's made up of little, you know, a bunch of notes and whatnot, but the end experience is, you know, combining all the different sounds and whatever instruments are involved to create a whole 
sound. So the right side of the brain is always about this holistic processing, putting together pieces to create something larger. And, and you know, whereas the left side of the brain does more sequential processing. Okay, the two sides are constantly in in communication with each other across the corpus callosum. So it's not right to say that um, somebody is left brained or they're right brained. I mean, both brains are constantly operating, not both brains, both hemispheres, I should say, are constantly operating and, and communicating back and forth. So it's not like people use one side of the brain more than the other. That's kind of a myth. We're always using both sides of our brain, no matter what we do. It's just, you know, there's certain specialty um, areas in, in, in the left and right sides. Um, that is knowing, but before I leave here, that's known as lateralization, meaning that one side of the brain performs the task more than the other side. So we say that language is lateralized in the left hemisphere, meaning that the left hemisphere does most language processing. The right hemisphere does some, by the way, but, but most of it's in the left for the majority of people. Okay, so that's the, um, the hemispheres of the brain. Let's take a, a look at the lobes of the brain, and this should all be with you. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, I wanna concentrate on, on kind of one main area in each lobe of the brain that I want you to know. So we'll start with the frontal lobe. You can see it colored green here in the left picture. It's, we use a frontal lobe for problem solving. Person, it's personality and emotions, uh, reasoning, motor planning, speaking. Um, one area in particular that I, I want to point out is, is where it says movement, that, that you know, purple kind of uh, tube looking thing that goes across the brain. I mean, it was right at the back of the frontal lobe is the, is, the area responsible for movement, we call it the motor cortex, and it runs across your brain, across both hemispheres, left and right. So that is where you initiate initiate all of your movements. Once again, it's right at the back of the frontal lobe. Um, moving back to that yellow area, we have the parietal lobe. This is responsible for sense of touch, spatial perception, knowing right from left, and reading, uh, at least academic, academically reading. Um, what I, the area I want you to know is is where it says body sensations. That's at the very you know front edge of the parietal lobe, and that is called our somatosensory cortex. S O M A T O sensory cortex. So somatosensory is all one word. And that is where we um, sense, you know, um, body sensations, things like touch and heat and um, pressure. So, you know, if, 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 a, if a fly lands on your arm and you feel it, it it's, you're, it's being registered in the somatosensory cortex. Or you know you you feel some heat against your skin when the sun's shining bright, and that's being registered in that area. Okay, um, going to the back of the brain, we have the occipital lobe. This is responsible for vision and color perception, also recognizing printed words. Um, the main area I want to point out is the visual cortex, where, where it says vision. That is where we um, engage in, in visual perception. Uh, all the information coming in through your eyes and over at the left side, you know, where, is where your eyes would be waves. It all goes to the very back of the brain, all that um, light information that comes in through your eyes. It gets transformed, or actually the word is transduced into electrical impulses which travel to the visual cortex. And then we can perceive what we're looking at. Um, on the sides of the brain, we have the fourth lobe called the temporal lobe. 
This is responsible for understanding language, organizing and sequencing, memory and hearing. And in particular, I want to point out that the area labeled hearing is called the auditory cortex. So there's a major cortex that I want to point out in, in each of the lobes. We have the frontal lobe with the motor cortex, parietal lobe with the somatosensory cortex, the occipital lobe has a visual cortex, and the temporal lobe has the auditory cortex. Two other important areas um, are, have to do specifically with language. And you can see towards the front of the brain, there is uh, an area called Broca's area. This area is um, responsible for speech production. Um, it is part of the frontal lobe. And it's usually on the left side of the brain. So it's not, it's not in, in both hemispheres. So that's speech production, Broca's area. And then we have Wernicke's area, where uh, you can see it. Um, it's colored kind of orangey yellow, anyways, where it says language. Um, it's, it, it looks like it says Wernicke's, but it's pronounced Wernicke's. Anyways, uh, that is for speech comprehension. So Broca's area is for speech production. Wernicke's area is for speech comprehension. It is part of the temporal lobe, and it is on the left side of the brain as well. Um, I guess I'll go through the last two parts listed here. Uh, the cerebellum, this is um, responsible for balance and equilibrium, coordination of voluntary movement, fine muscle control. Um, so you use your cerebellum if you're dancing or if you're doing, I don't know, um, um, I don't know, well rehearsed movements like that are, that are precise, like something like swing, swinging a bat at a ball, you'd be using your cerebellum to help coordinate the action. I mean, you initiate movement from your motor cortex, but the cerebellum helps to, you know, the, with the whole coordination, like in the timing and things. So if you think about somebody dancing, a lot of it has to do with timing and, and balance. And same as swinging at a pitch, you know, has to do with timing and, and coordination of, of doing it all at the right at the right time. Anyways, uh, um, one thing I mentioned about the cerebellum is certainly susceptible to alcohol. This is this is the part of the brain that they're kind of testing when when they have you, you know, walk a straight line one foot in front of the other during a, a roadside test, or, you know, stand on one foot and touch your nose or something. Because as a cerebellum, if you have been drinking, the cerebellum gets affected and it causes a lack of balance and coordination. This is why people that are drunk stumble around a lot. Their cerebellum is, is drunk. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, finally we have the brain stem. This is, you know, this is connected to the, um, Spinal cord, it's, so it's right at the very kind of base of the brain, and uh, and so it controls a lot of very rudimentary functions of of living. So things like breathing and heart rate and body temperature, uh, alertness, and the ability to sleep, digestion and swallowing, a lot of really basic functions. So your brainstem is like kind of it's down closest to your body of all these. Of all the brain areas, and and so it's controlling basic functions. And uh, if you think about evolution, humans used to have smaller brains um, way back when, and and but we always had a brainstem. You know, like that's you know, brainstems have been around in, in, in ever since there were there were primates, or in, in um, actually probably most animals have brainstems. I would guess, anyways, uh, because you know. It controls real basic function. So as humans evolved and, and became smarter and developed language and and logic and, and, and mathematical skills and you know, et cetera, our brains expanded outwards. 
So closer to the bottom is more primitive function. Out the outer layer of the brain is more advanced thinking functions. So you're using kind of the outer layer, layer of your brain when you use language and when you perform logic and when you do calculus or algebra or things like that. Um, okay, because you know the brain has expanded outwards to to um, to kind of like um, to give uh, our brains room for these for the for the advanced functions, I guess. Okay, moving to the right picture. Um, here is a, the they're showing you the limbic system. It's not labeled, but it's called the limbic system. And I just want to talk about two parts that are pictured here, the amygdala. This is where your emotions and your mood originates. That's kind of like the emotional center of your brain. And the hippocampus, a very important area for memory. It processes and stores memories and it's kind of the initiator of new memories. So, um, when I, I don't know, when I form a new memory of what I did earlier today, it's going to originate in the hippocampus. It doesn't get stored there. Um, the hippocampus kind of originates the memory and, and it's needed to, to have memory. But then the, the actual memory at some point will be stored in, in other areas of the brain. Uh, but without the hippocampus, you would not be able to form any new memories. So it is the memory formation center, I guess. Okay, let's go on. Um, okay, so going down to the cellular level, the human brain is made of, up of approximately 86 billion neurons. Uh, neurons are specialized communication cells. And your your brain is just full of them. Your whole nervous system is full of neurons, which is why we call it a nervous system. Um, okay. Um, so I, I said that the communication cells, specialized communication cells, they they send messages between from you know between the neurons pass messages between them. That actually is what thinking is. It's a bunch of neurons, you know, exchanging. Um, neurotransmitters and and, and um, in a sense communicating from one to another. Um, okay, neurons send messages via neurotransmitters to other nerve cells through axons, and they receive messages through dendrites. I'm going to go back and forth with this picture here. Um, it's not the best picture, but okay, here we see um, a couple of neurons. Um, if you look at the first picture there, um, you can see a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron. Um, so the presynaptic neuron is communicating to the postsynaptic neuron. And it's called pre and postsynaptic because they communicate across an area called the synapse. It is where they the two neurons, you know, come very close together and there's only a small gap between them. And that is where they are going to communicate with neurotransmitters. Um, those long tubes, well, first of all, I, let me start off with kind of the round parts of those, of those neurons are, are what we call the cell body. You can see each one has a nucleus in the cell body, a little purple um, nucleus. Um, coming out of that round part, those are called dendrites. Uh, dendrites receive information, as this last cell was saying. So uh, uh, they receive information through the dendrites. So you can see the postsynaptic neuron, its dendrite is receiving information from the presynaptic neuron. The long tubes, those are called axons coming out of the cell bodies. And so uh, messages are sent along the axon. So you can see that there's an arrow uh, in the presynaptic neuron from the cell body. Um, 
that is where a charge will originate. And I say it's a charge because in order, it's an electrical process within a, a neuron. Um, and so a charge originates in the cell body, it travels along the axon, and then it causes neurotransmitters to be released to that will um, communicate to other neurons. Let me go back here, make sure I get all these points. Okay, so the place where the axon from one neuron meets the dendrite of another neuron is called the synapse. Synapse literally just uh, translates to small gap, okay, or a tiny gap might be more accurate, tiny gap. And then it just means a little space. Okay. Um, neurons and their synaptic connections make up the gray matter of the brain. Um, okay. I, I'm not going to really expand upon that point. Um, anyway, so back to this picture here. Um, so neurons connect where their axon meets the dendrites of another neuron at the synapse. So, anyways, I was talking about you know how these two neurons, these two neurons communicating, presynaptic to postsynaptic. Now they have close-ups um, of you know of the actual synapse where the two neurons are communicating. So the the axon terminal that you see. And once again, it's still in this first picture. That's at the very end of, of the axon of, of the presynaptic neuron. It has these little terminal buttons. The terminal buttons contain neurotran the, uh, the neurotransmitter uh, brain, which is basically brain chemicals, things like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, et cetera. Okay. Um, any, any specific neuron will only deal in one type of neurotransmitter. So that, you know, maybe these are dopamine neurons or maybe they're serotonin neurons. Anyways, um, uh, you can see there's a small gap between that, that what's called the, um, uh, the axon terminal button and the, and the dendrite of the receiving postsynaptic neuron. And you can see in the second picture that chemicals being re released the chemical, the neurotransmitter chemicals are stored in what's called vesicles. That just basically means um, little bag, okay? It means like a little bag. Okay, so it's like little bags of chemicals. Um, uh, okay, um, so when the presynaptic neuron wants to communicate to the postsynaptic neuron, it releases neurotransmitters into the synapse. The neurotransmitters will bind um, onto some special receptor sites on the on the postsynaptic dendrite. So you can see little, there's a picture of a few receptor sites. Um, the receptor sites are specialized for one type of neurotransmitter. So if there happens, so if this is a dopamine uh, neuron, and if there's some serotonin floating around in the system, it's not going to affect it at all. Um, the serotonin won't bind to these receptor sites, but whenever there's dopamine release, um, and it will cause a reaction in the in the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so neurons connect at synapses. So we have the word synaptogenesis. I'll go back to the, the top here, and that basically just translates to the development of new synapses. Um, after a baby is born. New synapses may be formed at an incredible rate of more than, get this, more than 1 million connections per second. So after baby's born, the brain is forming a million, you know, at certain points at least, forming a million new connections, which means synapses where two neurons are, you know, coming together to form a, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to call it a connection, even though they don't actually touch but you know they're 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 they connected when they line up like this and 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 the um the dendrite is, is next to the the axon um, um terminal button so if up to a million of these connections in the brain are being formed per second it's an incredible rate um okay uh after overproduction of synapses in infancy 
in, including early childhood. Um, there's still overproduction going on. Uh, overproduction means that the, the brain forms more connections than will ever be needed initially. And then there's a pruning process that starts. Um, kind of a middle childhood um, is when it really get, gets going. I mean, our brains are have the most connections um, around the age of six or seven, then we'll, it's the most connections we'll ever have in our life. So, you know, during infancy and early childhood, there's this overproduction, our brains become, you know, has, have, have all these extra connections that a lot of them aren't even being used. But as this child learning new things, these new connections start going into use, right? So like, it's kind of like the brain just says, look, I'm gonna produce, a, you know, I'm gonna produce as many connections as you could possibly need. And then so if a child is learning a ton of new stuff and, and um, then there's, they've got a brain to support it. They've got all these unused connections that they can, they can use to, um, um, you know, to, I don't know, support their piano lessons that they're taking. And, and they use some other ones as they learn to, um, they learn to read and, and, when they learn to to uh, throw a ball, I mean that's going to take some connection. So there's a lot that the child's learning, and um, so eventually around six or seven, the brain's mag has, has the most connections ever, and, and then they start to disappear. Um, the brain kind of slims down; it starts to get rid of the unused connections, it's called pruning. Just like you, you know, you prune up a plant, you kind of you you snip off some of the some of the um, branches or, uh, or um, I don't know what, what they're called on flowers, like stems or like the way it was, maybe they're just called branches. Anyways, like the ones that, that aren't thriving, you know, they're, they're not particularly strong. You kind of, you, you prune them away so that the strongest branches will, you know, become even stronger. There's, there's gonna be more energy to go into those ones. You know, rather than supporting a bunch of branches that aren't doing very well or aren't really being used much. So this is the pruning process. So our, our brains become more streamlined and efficient. With less connections, the brain can operate faster. Um, and this is exactly what happens as we move from middle childhood into adolescence. The pruning continues. The pruning is going to continue all the way into into early adulthood, um, as as we as the last parts of our brain kind of finish the developing. Okay, um, there are. <clears throat> by the way, when, when I say pruning, um, they basically deteriorate and disappear. Pruning means that the, the connections de deteriorate and disappear. Okay, um, plasticity of the brain is our next topic. And plasticity of the brain just means that your brain is malleable, meaning that it, it can change. And it does, it changes every day. And okay? your brain changes in response to uh, environmental stimuli and environmental influences. So, as I learn a new skill, my brain changes in certain ways to support that skill. Maybe, um, so in some cases, it might mean that there are new connections formed or there's old connections that are strengthened to support this new skill I'm learning. Anyways, but there is a change in the brain. Anything you learn, so your brain changes every day you know, because you learn something every day, right? Um, and when I say learning, that includes memory formation. You know, in order to store memories from today, my brain's going to make some little changes structurally at the cellular level. And this is what plasticity is about. We don't, we used to believe, you know, the brain would, is eventually set after it develops. Your brain never changes again. This was the old thinking. And before we understood about this plasticity. So kind of like you had a, a set brain, just like a, the wiring and components in a computer are set. 
we believe that the brain was set. And then you would just kind of put information in, just like you put information into your computer. But when we learned about plasticity, it just, you know, it was a whole new ball game in a sense. It would be like having a computer where the wiring inside is constantly changing as you put more information in your computer. It adjusts itself and becomes more efficient and at, at storing whatever you're putting in. I mean, this is what your brain does. It changes in response to what you're learning and, and the new memories that you're forming. So we have constantly changing brains. And anyways, two, there are two types of um, two types of brain development that or types of plasticity that occurs experience expectant and experience dependent um, brain development. And the experience, experience expectant brain development occurs because our brain brain expects certain events to happen. So these, these are experiences that we expect every child to experience. They're very basic things. Um, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or you know, like a, or whether you live in India or China or the US. I mean, you will, there's certain things every child is expected to experience. So for instance, um, being exposed to light, okay? I mean, like you're exposed to light after you're born. I mean, you come out of the darkness into light. Now you might say, well, if you're born blind, you know, not really registering light into the brain, but I mean, there are, there's, you know, exceptions, but basically, but even if you're blind, blind, you still have, you know, your skin is being exposed to light. I mean, like that, you know, but anyway, for a normal healthy child, every child is going to be exposed to light. They're gonna have light into their retinas. And this is going to register in the brain. Okay, you know, this is our visual system and you know, some pathways of form to support the visual system. Um, you're expected to hear sounds. Once again, you know, unless you're deaf, but you will hear sounds if you're born. Right from the time you come out, you'll be hearing things uh, outside of the womb. Um, and actually, even in the womb, you you hear some some things. But uh, you're expected to hear language, and the brain responds to it. We we when we hear enough language, we learn to speak. No one teaches us. Your brain expects to language input, and then it operates on it. It analyzes it, and it and it um, basically becomes able to to correctly speak the language that it's been exposed to. Um, um, what else? Touch things, you're expected to touch things after you're born. So, so when I say basic things, I'm talking about things that, you know, like so basic that every child experiences, you, you know, you're exposed to light, you see things, like you, you'll see objects and things, that you, you'll hear sounds, you'll hear language, you, you'll touch things in the environment, so you learn about different textures and whatnot. And, and all of this is, is stuff that the brain does expect. Our brains are built to, you know, analyze all this information, the, the, the visual information coming in through our eyes, the auditory information coming in through our ears. I mean, we have specialized equipment for the brain to analyze these things. You know, we touch things with our, our, the, our special um, sensory receptors and our fingers and, and, um, and the brain operates on this and it changes in response to what you're seeing and hearing and touching. Okay, so that's ex experience expected. Normal experiences that, that our brain expects as a, as a normal event of being alive. And then we have experience dependent brain development. This is much more individual, depends on each person's particular experiences. So your brain will change differently than somebody else's brain. Like, you know, all of our brains change similarly in response to light and hearing sounds and hearing language and touching things. But I might learn to play piano as a child, whereas you might, you know, do some kind of sports. You learn to play basketball as a child. I mean, two very different experiences. Um, and so my brain's going to develop around my piano lessons and and there's going to be pathways to support that. Your brain's going to create pathways to support your your basketball, you know, skill learning. 
um, you know, maybe I do puzzles and you play cards and um, I end up playing chess and you like to golf and whatever. I mean, we each have individual experiences. Um, some of us read more than others or are read to more than others as children. Um, some of us go to zoos as children, some of us may not. Uh, we may go to museums uh, if your parents take you, other people won't, won't. I mean, so we all have tons of individual experiences. We have different friends, you know, you and I, or me, like even if I'm even if it's comparing me and my sibling, I would have a different set of friends than they do. I would have different experiences. Um, if I would go to a different school than you, I have different experiences. So these are all the individual environmental experiences, and there's a ton of them. We actually have like more. They 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 found that we have like um, even children within the same family have more independent individual experiences than they have shared experiences. So even though they they share the same set of parents, let's say, they still have very individual experiences with their parents. Uh, they live in the same house, but they 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 both you know they both. Um, experience the health differently. They may, they may have separate areas they, they hang out. I mean, they might go to the same school, but it doesn't mean that they're in the same class or have the same teachers. It doesn't mean they don't have the same peer groups. So I mean, even though there are shared experiences among siblings, our individual experiences really determine who we become because of this type of brain development, experience-dependent brain development. My brain changes into a uh, in response to all of my unique experiences that I have compared to my brother or even my twin, if I had a twin, and we're genetically similar, this is why identical twins end up different, is that they have different experiences. So their brains change somewhat. Whereas they, even though they have identical DNA, they're not going to end up with identical brains. Yeah? And that's why identical twins with the exact same genetics can end up having very different personalities at times. I want to give you one example um, about this experience-dependent brain development. Um, this was a, a study by Albert, E-L-B-E-R-T, et al. Um, Albert et al. That just means El Albert and others. Okay. Um, he found that in violinists, the right side of the motor cortex, which controls the left hand of the body, had way more uh, synaptic connections than the left side of the motor cortex uh, controlling the, the, the right hand because of the intricate fingering that's done with the left hand. So if you're a right-handed violinist, you would hold the, the violin in your left hand you know, up against your, your chin, I guess you do it, and, and, and you do the fingering with your left hand. Your right hand would use the bow, and that's a far less intricate movement. You know, more, it's a little bit more back and forth, and I mean, it's, there's still nuanced movement, but, but the fingering is much more delicate, fine motor control. So when these violinists played violin for years, the right side of the motor cortex uh, controlling the left hand just developed a whole bunch of new, a whole bunch of uh, many more connections than the left side of the motor cortex controlling the right hand because they, that one didn't need to make connections. You know, it, it, there was connections about how to move the bow back and forth, but but this, the fingering was 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 you know um, very intricate and detailed, and and so this just showed that you know in the same person. You know, one side of the brain, one hemisphere of the brain versus the other, um, developed differently because there was different experiences that they were having with their left versus their right hand. And so this would be true of anyone. Like, you know, I if you're if you have a dominant hand, you're not like like I do. I'm right-handed, and I, my left hand is pretty useless. Or, um, you know, I can't write with it, or really throw, or do much with it. I mean, like. Is it? I'm. I'm sure if you were to look at my motor cortex, I mean, I would have way more connections, probably in, in the left hemisphere, because I do almost everything with my right hand. And so, um, anyways, 
So that's, that's experience dependent brain development. Your brain is responding to your experiences. It responded to the violinists, for instance, uh, in their fingering technique. Okay, I, I should keep moving. I know this is a, a long section, but okay, myelination of neurons, for neurons to work efficiently, they need to be coated with a fatty substance known as myelin. So this is like the way that we insulate, you know, met, metal wires um, or copper wires. And, um, so the current runs true and quick. I mean, we don't have bare wires laying around. I've got wires, a wire coming on my computer that goes into the power. I mean, there's no bare wire, right? There's a plastic or rubber coating around that, that's actually around the, the wire. Well, that's exactly what myelination is like. You can think of the axon as like a wire. It actually is going to carry a charge, just like you know any anything I have plugged in here carries a charge. Um, and and imagine that my my computer uh, wire that you you know imagine it had it was exposed. Well, running from my computer down to to where the plug is, the outlet is. I mean, it's touching certain things. I mean, the charge would go into this metal lamp, it's touching, it would, you know, anyway, the charge would dissipate and you would you would get a lot less charge at the end of the wire than, we're at, than what, how it started because the, some of the charge might go into the floor or the table or, or if I touch it, it would go in, I'd get shocked, it would go into me. Um, so obviously we have to protect the wires and this is what myelin does. It protects the axon, which is like a wire it insulates it. It's a fatty substance that goes around it. You can see it in the picture there. It is showing the, the, the blue thing is the, is the actual axon and the myelin is surrounding it. Um, myelination continue, continues throughout childhood and adolescence. Myelination goes on right until your early 20s. Um, okay. Um, Different areas develop at different times or and myelination happens at different times. So the brain continues to developing obviously all throughout childhood, all throughout adolescence. Um, certain things happen in childhood, uh, myelination of speech centers and motor centers, particularly fine motor skills. This myelination goes on early. And so it is, it really kind of, um, completes the process during childhood. I mean, um, as you're learning all your major, you know, fine motor skills in childhood, I mean, you can develop, develop other skills as you get older and adolescence. And when I, I'm not saying that, but, but your basic fine motor skills, I mean, they're developed in childhood, the, and they're important to have. You need to be able to reach and hold things and pick things up and, uh, and feed yourself. And, and so, this myelination goes on early to get that system ready early. The speech center is, is very important. So that happens early. You're learning language, you know, starting in the, really in the first year of your life. And, you know, you're going to be speaking by, um, you know, in your, in, in your toddler years. I mean, so like, um, it finishes and like, it myelinates very quickly, very early to support this rapidly developing speech center. So things like speech center and movement, motor centers, fine motor skills, these are all really important and, um, and basic kinds of skills that, that need to be ready to early. So that's all done in childhood. The last two points here, these are referring more to adolescence. Um, development is still occurring in the prefrontal cortex. They mean still occurring in adolescence. This prefrontal cortex is right at the front of our frontal lobe. This is where we do our reasoning, judgment, and impulse control. In fact, the prefrontal cortex is really the last area of the brain that to kind of finish developing. So when I talked about that your brain is still developing into early adulthood and there's still myelination going on, if you guys are like 20, 21, 22 years old, your prefrontal cortex is still finishing up. It's still myelinating. Why is it doing so late? This is a really important part of the body. I mean, I mean, part of the brain. Well, the prefrontal cortex has taken all of childhood and adolescence to really develop properly. It's been, 
it's been developing and developing, you know, because it is the most complex and 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 like a, and it is really the most important area of the brain. So it is where you make all of your decisions, you, uh, whether you're moving or talking or whatever you just whatever you're doing, you're kind of controlling yourself and your actions uh, and your behaviors from your prefrontal cortex. It's such a complex, important area that it, the development takes so long to for it to really finish and become mature. And so this is why it continues developing all through childhood, all through adolescence, and into early adulthood. It's kind of finishing up um, very early in adulthood, and the myelination is completing. Um, by the way, that's one of the reasons why um, you know middle-aged teenagers don't have, often have a lot of impulse control and don't always show good judgment or reasoning skills, is because that area of the brain's not done yet. And then similarly, if you think of children, they they really don't have good impulse control or reasoning or judgment. So it takes a long time to gain an adult level of reasoning, judgment, and impulse control. Okay, the connections between reasoning centers and emotion centers, uh, referring to the amygdala, are still developing. Once again, this is referring to adolescence. Um, they, um, these connections, to the to the emotion centers um, um, between your reasoning and emotion centers, they're very late developing as well, which is why it, it, it's often hard for adolescents, like once again early or mid adolescents, to control their emotions. And, and you know because the connections to the to the reasoning center, which is basically it's, it's the prefrontal cortex and the emotion centers, that's still developing in adolescence. So this is why there's a, a change that happens uh, from childhood and, and early adolescence. As you get into, you know, into later adolescence and early adulthood, and people be, just become they they control their emotions better. They control their impulses. They they have better logic and judgment and reasoning and decision making skills um, as this prefrontal cortex finishes up and the connections between your emotions and your reasoning center. Um, as they finish up as well, because you, that allows you to control your emotions. Once those connections between reasoning and the, and the amygdala are complete, and then you can kind of control your emotions. You don't, you realize I, I don't have to cry if I don't want to, or, you know, I can, I can put a brave face on you. So this helps you control emotions. Whereas young children, you know, obviously if you watch a young child, they really can't control their emotions. Um, okay, let me go on. Um, so I'm going to just talk about um, a few disorders to finish up this first section. And, and these have to do with brain development. And so we have cerebral palsy, first of all. The symptoms include muscle rigidity or lack of control of movement. Uh, more specifically, somebody with cerebral palsy will, will show difficulties with uh, coordination, difficulties with movement, difficulties with muscle tone, and difficulties with speech. You know, those are kind of the, the big four. So difficulties with coordination, movement, muscle tone, and speech. Uh, it's caused by abnormal development of the brain or damage to it, either prenatally, during birth, or after birth, up to the age of three. Uh, some of the some factors that are involved with an increased risk for cerebral palsy are premature birth, uh, low birth weight, conception of two or more fetuses at the same time, you know, like having twins or triplets, or, um, maternal exposure to toxins or infections, um, and lack of oxygen oxygen, excuse me, during the birth process. Uh, you know, sometimes the baby loses oxygen uh, when the umbilical cord gets squeezed. If it goes on for too long, it, one of the possible, they say possible outcomes is, is, you know, some brain damage that may cause cerebral palsy. Um, okay, let's go on. We have autism spectrum disorder. Um, 
This is a pervasive developmental disorder. It's linked with brain function. Um, there are, um, there's three kind of areas of research with autism spectrum disorder. Um, some research looks at brain structure. So maybe there's a difference in this in some in one of the, one or more of the structures of the brain, like, um, and the, and I'll, I'll give you an example, um, you know, in a moment. Um, there's also research looking at brain functioning. Maybe the brain structure is the same, but certain areas function differently, which causes the autism. And there's also research in the third area, which looks at co connectivity between different parts of the brain. So maybe maybe it's some connections between one part and another that it leads to the cerebral palsy rather than structure or specific functioning. It's it's these these connections. Um, anyway, so the reason that they're looking at these three areas is we don't have a great understanding of cerebral, oh, sorry, of autism spectrum disorder, I should tell you, let me just say. And, um, and so it was still, there's still different lines of research and there's, there's all three of these areas show some promise as to, as to kind of finding some pieces to the puzzle. <clears throat> uh, one, one finding that I wanted to mention was that the, this has to do with brain structure. The, they found um, in, in research that the amygdala has been found, it's been found to be enlarged in the brains of young children with autism spectrum disorder. They have an enlarged amygdala. Remember, the amygdala is responsible for your emotional experience and, and your emotional expression. Uh, and this research found that the larger the, the, the amygdala, the more difficulty the individual had with social relationships. So larger is not always better. The larger the amygdala, the more difficulties they had. And so this, so this was, uh, you know, a key finding because this made a lot of sense. Um, let's look at, the, at what characterizes autism. Uh, difficulties with social interaction. Well, these larger amygdalas led to more difficult social relationships for whatever reason. Um, problems with verbal and nonverbal communication and also repetitive compulsive behaviors or interests. But I mean, it, it wasn't surprising that Oh, maybe the our emotional center plays a role, and this is why they have so much trouble connecting. Somebody with autism has a lot of trouble connecting to others often, and 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 you know with specific social interactions with others. And so that may be one piece of the puzzle that the amygdala figures into it. Um, okay, um, this is a chart showing. Um, the prevalence of, of autism spectrum disorder. Um, and if, you know, it goes from 2000 down to 2012 is, is when they, these were the years that they were studying it. Um, and so if you go back to 2000 and 2002, you can see that the prevalence rate in the um, second last column, you know, was around 6.6, 6.7 per thousand, which is uh, about one in under, in every 150 kids would have autism. And then you go down to the bottom, last couple, 2010, 2012. So this is you know about 10 years later after those first couple of readings. And, and now we're up to like 14.6, 14.7 per 1,000. And it's down to like a one in 68 chance from a one in 150 chance. So you can see the rate has more than doubled. If you double 6.6, 6.7, the first, um, very first surveillance, surveillance year here. If you double that, it would come up to 13.4. So you can see the last prevalence rates are more than double the earlier ones. So in this 10 year period, it looked, it at least appears that autism spectrum disorder prevalence rates doubled. And this is what, this kind of finding is what led to a lot of people looking for things like perhaps it's vaccinations is causing autism. I mean, a lot of theories um, came up because these were alarming kinds of numbers. In actual fact, 
we don't really believe that uh, there was a lot more autism between 2000 and 2012. Why, well, why did the numbers go up? There, there's three reasons. We became better, first of all, at identifying children um, that, that maybe used to be overlooked. We are better at, at, at diagnosing and identifying children with autism. So that's one, so that would lead to more cases because there's some that used to go undiagnosed. We, we missed them, but now we have better techniques. Secondly, expanded criteria. There's actually some people now that end up being called, they end up fitting into this autism spectrum disorder category that never used to be. So of course that's gonna raise the numbers as well. We're kind of letting more into the club. So there were some like fringe cases that we used to say, no, they're not, they, they're not autistic. Now they are, yes, they are. Okay, anyways, and then third, um, we can now identify autism spectrum disorder at younger ages. As early as 18 months now, like a year and a half, they can they can um, identify autism. And it you this never used to be the case. So it used to be that autism wouldn't be identified until at least the, in, into the, into the preschool years and sometimes into the, the primary school years. But um, but now it's like a year and a half old, and they, you know they can identify and diagnose it. And so. So because we're identifying and diagnosing it earlier, that also leads to more identification. So anyways, these three facts I mentioned, really they believe that this is what explains this increase shown in the chart. And that we didn't actually gain more cases of autism. We just widened the category. We identified the ones we used to miss and we started identifying earlier. So we have a wider range of people that we test. Finally, the last slide of this first section is about schizophrenia. And we're gonna mention this e here, even though it's not, um, it, it, it's only a childhood disorder in rare cases. There is certainly something called, you know, um, uh, there is a childhood schizophrenia, but it's, it's fairly rare, I'll tell you. Um, but let's go through a schizophrenia anyways. Symptoms are delusions. That means false beliefs, believe something that's not true. Hallucination, hallucinations, you see or hear something that's not there. Uh, disorganized speech, disorganized or catatonic behavior uh, or negative symptoms. Negative symptoms means there are things missing that used to be part of your personality or part of your behavior. So, so an example of a negative system is symptom is something called poverty of, of speech, meaning the person talks a lot less than they used to, or they maybe they don't talk at all uh, anymore. So that would be a negative symptom because something's lacking. Um, um, sometimes um, some of schizophrenia may show a lack of, of emotions. That would be a negative symptom. Something is missing. They're not showing the emotions they used to show. So negative symptoms are, are when something is subtracted, something is missing from their normal behavior. Positive symptoms are when something is added. These first uh, examples are positive symptoms. Delusions, they never used to have them, now they do. That's a positive symptom. Hallucination, the positive doesn't mean good. Hallucination, you know, they never used to have them, now they have them. So if, if something new has been added to the behavior, it's called a positive symptom. Negative symptoms mean something is missing from their normal behavior. Anyways, um, uh, so those are kind of the major symptoms. Um, different schizophrenics have different combinations of, of these symptoms. Uh, it's more, much more, I, I told you it's rare in childhood, uh, which is called an early onset form, but uh, it typically appears in late adolescence or early adulthood. Um, okay. Uh, and that will do it for the first section. And that was on brain development.